he has, over a number of years, you probably won't uh, appreciate me talking about how many, and let him do that himself. And um, he has coached people at all levels of organizations. He has coached executives in multi, multi-billion dollar companies. He has, mo he has coached people <clears throat> trying to start out on their own. And he's learned a lot about people along the way. And we're privileged to have him here tonight to tell us about that journey. Ladies and gents, please put your hands together for Mr. Martin Brennan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Martin Brennan, and I'm really delighted to be here this evening. Um, I had this fear just when I came up with the lights in the face, because I don't have any notes, that the lights will go down in about 20 minutes, they'll come back up and nobody will be here. <laughs> but hopefully you will be as well. I'm kind of looking forward to going home because I want to tell the kids that I, it's the first time ever I've played to a full house. <laughs> and that's kind of looking, that's kind of good when you're not a household name in your own house. It's kind of good to say something like that. And the other interesting one is I was so delighted as well that I can take off my glasses because I don't have any reading uh, to do. So it makes me look a bit cooler. But if I wander into the audience, you might direct me back to the stage. <laughs> I'd appreciate that as well. Um, Adon asked me, he says, would you take a challenge? Would you talk to folk about something that you learned in your work as coaching? And I said I would. And I was quite chuffed when he asked me. And after the chuffness wore away, I got a bit frightened one day because I was saying to myself, what qualifies me to speak to a group of professional people about coaching and about benefits, etc.? I was going to go the expert route. But then I realized I'm 25 years coaching, and when I started coaching, an expert was somebody who traveled more than 25 miles and had slides. <laughs> now, tonight I only came 15 miles and I have no slides, so I can't go that particular route. But one thing I can use by way of qualification is the following. Over the last quarter of a century, I have worked with some fantastically talented people in all walks of life. Self-employed, artisans, managing multi-billion dollar companies. I'm so delighted and privileged to have learned from them. And that's what I'd like to share with you as well tonight, some of the things I've picked up. I'd ask one permission. I'm not here to say you should live like this or you should live like that. I'm just answering the question that Adon asked me, what did you learn? And that's what I'd like to share with you. When I started coaching, this is the only prop I have tonight. This was an article in the Sunday Independent in 1991. And it was about Martin Brennan and a new age technique called performance coaching. Now, the only reason they put it on this section is because there was no section on witchcraft in the paper. <laughs> and that's kind of how coaching was seen at the very start. If you were sent to a coaching program, it was very similar to a premiership manager being told he had the backing of the board. <laughs> it was not a good sign. An interesting point is when you came back, somebody says, uh, was it one-to-one? One-to-one. -to -one. Ooh, that's not good. One-to-one. <laughs> that's really terrible. Ter did he give you an action plan with goals? He did. Oh, not good at all. <laughs> By the way, did he use terms like, that's interesting? He did. Oh, best to look with that. By the way, I could ask you a question. Can I have your car parking space? Because there's no doubt it meant that somebody was moving out of the company. But right now, it's come to full circle. It's come to full circle, and it's seen as a valuable intervention to help people, particularly high potential people, in all walks of life. And what I was hoping to share with you, as I say, is something that I've picked up along the way. The first thing that I picked up is that you need a valid coaching model if you're helping people to improve. And the model that I've always used was based on two stanchions. Number one, it was based on awareness. Number two, it was based on responsibility. And the client was always helped to become aware of what they were good at, not so good at, and then work with the coach to get a plan for the future and take responsibility to convert that awareness into something magic. And awareness looked at things like strengths, limiting beliefs, problem solving, conflict management, 360 feedback. And then we laid it out and hopefully took a fabric that would take us into the future. And that was where the client could take responsibility to take that learning and work with it. It's not counselling, but part counselling comes into it. It looks back and it values looking back, but coaching never lets the past interfere negatively with the future. 
It respects the journey, but it really looks at ways in which we can create our own future based on new pictures that Naomi was talking about, new uh, visions that we could use to improve ourselves. By the way, it's not everything either. It's just a tool to help people. There are lots of other tools out there, like uh, counselling, like education, like training, like mentoring. So I don't think it's a panacea for everything, but it's a good part of the suite of efforts that we can use to help people. There are a number of models that we use in coaching as well. There's the GROW, the GROW model. There's the STAR, the STAR model. I use the COPON, the COPON model. <laughs> and the COPON model is based on the following. You listen to people, you trend what they're saying, and then hopefully help them to convert it into some practical solutions for their success into the future. It's a great privilege being a coach, there's no doubt about that. And it's a valid role. But if you're to be a coach, I think there are a couple of prerequisites which are important as well. Number one, in sporting analogy, you have to love the game. You have to have played the game to some degree. But importantly, you must love coaching. And whilst it's important not to be corralled by the rules, it's important also that you live within them and that you obey the rules. And from that angle, uh, it's a very challenging but privileged profession to be in. What's also interesting as well is that I think you need some few grey hairs to be an effective coach at times. Because sometimes you need to challenge people. You need to listen and empathise and see what's going on in people's lives. And sometimes you just have to fist fight with some clients. It's not listening they need sometimes, it's beating up they need sometimes. And you know what's lovely when a plan comes together? I'm old enough to remember the A-team. But it's lovely when a plan comes together. And sometimes when coaching comes together, it's good for the process, but not always good for you. And what I mean by that, folks, is I remember a time when at least four or five coaching occasions where people left their jobs as a result of the coaching. I was very proud. But it didn't make invoice payment very good. <laughs> and that was something of interest. And I can remember with great pride, and at the time great trepidation and fear, when I was forcefully removed from at least two offices for giving feedback to a senior leader, he asked for it, but I was giving him the feedback that he needed as opposed to the feedback that he wanted. That definitely was bad for invoice payment as a great payment as well. And I suppose the last thing before going on to some of my lessons is that the coach has to be a servant. You have to use the skills of questioning and springboarding to help, and whether it's at work or professionally, to help other people to grow and to take their awareness and convert it into responsibility. And it's not about the coach, it's about the client. My story comes to mind, you know, my brother, he hates flying. And he was on a plane one day going from New York to London and he was quite stiff and he was a bit worried. And at about 25, 30,000 feet, over the intercom came the sound, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Uh, we are presently flying at 25,000 feet on this wonderful trip from London to New York. I hope you're enjoying your journey. Suddenly, oh my God, oh God, how could that happen? This is terrible. Silence. It was all about the captain, silence. 20 seconds later, the captain came back on. He says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really very sorry about that. There was a bit of a mishap here. One of the stewardesses built some boiling water, spilt it together with coffee all over my trousers. <laughs> you want to see the mess in the front of my trousers. And my brother shouted from the back, screw the mess on the front of your trousers. You want to see the mess in the back of mine? <laughs> So you've got to look after the client. It's not about the coach, and that's really important. <laughs> Folks, I mentioned to us future-focused, and it is future-focused, and it's important that we learn from the past, but the past must not stop us from developing and being the best we can be in the future. And could I offer, if you're coaching at work, two tips that I picked up along the way. The first one I learned from my mother, and the tip is as follow for coaching. If you don't want to lose it, don't risk it. I've worked with companies where managers have put the company budget on the line. Where driven people have put their family on the line. Put relationships on the line. And the challenge really is to say to people, even if it's that much you don't want to lose, don't risk it. Driven people putting their health on the line. And maybe a question for all of us tonight, are there things as you reflect upon what we're talking about that maybe you're putting on the line for success? And perhaps you need to sort of manage more effectively. 
And the second challenge that I picked up from coaching, if you're helping people at work, is that when you go into the future, you can have anything you want. You can't have everything. And that's an important challenge. And some people I've worked with try to go for everything, and they spread too thin. And as a result of that, lost everything. And then some managers or some owners will go for the one thing at such an extreme, fame, money, or whatever, at the expense of something dear to them. And maybe the challenge is to go nearer the one thing and add two or three that you can manage in order to get that balance. I think when people come for coaching, and a couple of things I've learned from it would be as follows. Ostensibly, they come for balance or challenge. But there seem to be four areas that, for me at least, emerge as to why people come for coaching. The first, and it probably relates to a lot of people in this room tonight, is the paradox of success. Because the skills that people had when they were starting a company, drive, energy, resilience, I'll bloody do it myself, can now get in the way of the shape of the company. And the very style that made it great could now be frightening people. So you don't delegate, or you overpower people, or nobody can work as hard as I can. And as a result, what started a company, in some senses, that same principle can damage the company. The second interesting point, I think, why people come for coaching is that they do things in their life and they're successful at them, but perhaps at the expense of something else. I'm very good at my job. My job is my life. But maybe I'm doing so at the expense of success at home, children, family, and relationships. Or even at work, you can have a fantastic producer in a production department, and they're getting stuff out the door, but morale is very poor. And as a result of that, of course, uh, the way you're doing the stuff, the balance is disrupted because being good at one can stop you from being good at the other. <coughs> Styles are the third reason, I think. A person using their style to an extreme, sometimes it can become dysfunctional. So a quiet person comes for coaching. They're seen as dependable, but not able to influence. Or a driven person comes for coaching. They're seen as effective, but overpowering. And there's some of the reasons why they might come. And the last one has to do with esteem. Sometimes the coach can help a person through encouragement because their esteem is low. And sometimes the client can help uh, or sorry, the customer can be helped by being challenged because their esteem is high. And sometimes when your esteem is low, you don't have the sort of challenge to drive on and change. And sometimes when it's high, you think that you have all the answers, so to speak, so you don't see evidential uh, areas where you could improve, and that's where coaching comes in. A couple of things that I've picked up from working with people, and I'm going faster because I see the red light. Um, a couple of things that I've... Picked up because of the uh, uh, Thank you. Um, but <laughs> the interesting one here, folks, is that people are brilliant. Ever see the fast show? People's going on the road. He said, aren't the stars brilliant? People are brilliant. And the one thing I've learned is this, that every human being that I've worked with will do things for reasons valid to themselves. That's the cop on piece. And managers try to coach others, but they don't get the fact that Martin doesn't get it. Well, the reason he doesn't get it is because he's singing to a different tune. And we've got to ensure when we offer advice, it makes sense to people. It even goes to the Almighty. There's a story where a guy one day was walking across a cliff face. And he fell down, and it was about a 500-foot ravine. And he held on to this little branch. And he looked down, it was very far down. And he shouted up, and he says, help, help. Is there anybody up there? Help. Next minute, the sky's open, small clap of thunder. And this voice came, yes, I am here, my son. Do not worry. Help me, please, I'm going to fall. Don't worry, he says. I'm now going to take my hand, raise it from the skies, and put it 25 feet below you. And when I count to three, I want you to let go, and I will pick you up. <laughs> Silence. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> so the advice we give might make sense to us, but not always to the people we're giving it to. <laughs> Folks, the very quick point after that is that one point I've found from working with people is everybody thinks they have more time than they think. There's a Chinese saying, be happy, it's later than you think. And all the things we're going to do that we're going to get around to. Imagine it, if you're 35 years of age now, in 360 months' time, you'll be 65. If you're 40, you'll be 75. And if you're 50, I'm not going to talk about it. But there's no doubt about it, this is what's happening. How many things are you putting off? How many items are you putting off on the long finger in terms of items that I want to fix? Relationships, family, that business idea. 
the development that I'm going to do. You don't have to do them all together, but the fact of the matter is this, that maybe you could put them into a vision and do them soon. Do them as part of a coaching plan, so to speak. Other point that I came across that's impacted when in coaching is that people value their jobs greatly. My job is what I do. And sometimes, even though people are unhappy in the job, they still stay with it because it is who they are, or is what they are. I found as well that a lot of people try to get balance between home and work. Generally speaking, men tell lies about balance. I'm going to do this. In fact, now my goals are aligned with my family goals. I'm doing very well. What that means is they put out the bin one night when his wife was sick. It doesn't mean anything else. There's no major changes coming. It was just one of those items that they're doing. Enough, <laughs> Enough of that, we know it. Some people have asked as well, is there a difference between men and women when you're working together? Well, in coaching terms, no. Successful people, you coach the same way. But when you get back to work, and I'm really speeding it up, when you get back to work, the fact of the matter is that you will see some differences. I see that women are starting to contribute so much more in the workplace. There are still the old discriminations. And we have to be fair about that. There are. Whether it is rearing children, or helping to rear children, and it's difficult at times. But I found when working with women in groups, I hate to say this, guys, I found that they're more grounded, there's less testosterone, and we tend to knock the right walls when we're doing some work together, etc., etc. And the fact of the matter is that on balance, I would say that the gents, it is still a man's world, and we probably still have the best of it. He said. <laughs> <laughs> and the very last point before I'm told to come down, where coaching can help, is that in a lot of cases, we go through lives and we get a vision of who we are, a personal vision. Self-talk is so important. And when we're growing up, we take a lot of stock coming into our heads. And as we're growing up, we get a picture of who we are. And then our self-talk perpetuates that picture and maintains it. But it's not always a positive picture. Because sometimes people pick up stuff from their childhood. It's not always good. You're just like your Uncle Tommy and he's a gobshite. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that all that negative stuff can stay with people. And the whole idea of coaching is to help people to see how you can create a more positive picture so that you can create a more positive future. I've stopped before somebody throws something at me. Thank you very much indeed. God bless. <laughs>